Hey everyone, uh, thanks for tuning in to this VidCon Now Vid Talk session. My name is Brennan Gann, I'll be your moderator. I'm a partner and chief social officer at Mechanism, been in the creator space for a long time now. Um, and our talk today is titled Crypto Communities, FWB, DAOs, and the Future of Web3. Um, this is probably the most excited I've been about a vid talk so far. Um, Web3 is just exploding. And uh, if you're like me, you're just like having trouble navigating it all and trying to absorb as much information as possible. And we're really fortunate here today. We've got uh, one of the biggest experts in the space to, uh, to talk with us. So helping us navigate all this is Trevor McFedries. I, I think I got that right. Uh, he's the founder of Friends with Benefits, uh, a slightly a highly sought after DAO and crypto club, as well as Brud, which everybody probably knows, Lil Michaela, it's uh, the CGI influencer created by them. So real quick, before we intro Trevor, uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to drop them in the audience chat below. We'll do our best to get to them uh, throughout the talk, um, but drop them in at any time. And with that, I'll hand it over to Trevor to introduce himself. Brandon, thank you very much. Um, I think you did a pretty good job covering all the bases, but excited <laughs> to chat Web3 and see if I can be helpful. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, thanks so much for being here. Um, before digging in, maybe we can take a step back and sort of define in Web3, or sorry, define in layman's terms what Web3 is and what DAOs are. Yeah, I think before we talk Web3, especially for some folks who might be younger here, it's probably important to give some context on, on Web1 and Web2. Um, Chris Dixon does a pretty good job describing, I'm going to paraphrase some of the things that he uses to describe them. Web1, we should think about it as like 1990 or 2005, and really it was all about open protocols. The stuff we use now, www.ftp, HTTP, um, all those protocols were decentralized, they were community governed, and most of the value really accrued to the edges of those networks. That meant the users and the builders of those protocols. Web 2, 2005 to 2020 or so, really was about siloed centralized services most of us know, Facebook, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Spotify. And really what you've seen is most of the value in those networks accrued to those individual companies. Um, what we're seeing now with Web 3 is a new era which really combines that decentralized, community-governed, open ethos of Web 1 with the kind of advanced modern functionality of Web 2. And so in practice, what that means is creating services and applications that create a ton of value for users as well as the builders, but the participants in those applications capture some of that value and upside as well. That's awesome. And who was it you referenced had, had sort of put together that summary? So the gentleman named Chris Dixon, who, who runs the crypto investing fund oh. at Greece and Horowitz. Awesome. I'm going to read up on that. Thanks. Um, Awesome. Well, uh, all right. That's an awesome overview. And uh, do you mind explaining for, for the viewers kind of what DAOs are and how that fits into that ecosystem? Certainly. So, so the easy way to describe what a DAO is, it's just an organization on chain. Um, so if you think about traditionally when you're building a company and organization, most of us know like a pretty autocratic rule. Uh, I'm the CEO of a traditional venture back C Corp. And what I say goes, if you're building an organization on chain that's community governed, oftentimes they'll use a governance token to make decisions. So it really is more of a democracy. If you're a user, if you're a builder, if you're someone who's involved with a platform and you have a token that allows you to have your, your voice heard, you get to shape the direction of that DAO or that organization. So a DAO loosely a group of people doing a thing, building a thing. There, there are DAOs for everything you could imagine from buying a professional sports team to social clubs and everything in between. That's awesome, it, which I think is a great segue into what you're up to. You founded Friends with Benefits, or as it's most commonly referred to as FWB. It's uh, it's probably the DAO that I, at least I'm most familiar with and seems to be getting a lot of press and sort of caught my eye. Do you mind explaining what FWB, FWB is and why people are joining? Yeah, and I think the idea that it would have caught your eye is exactly why I wanted to start it. Um, most people that I knew in Web3 and crypto were, you know, people who were intrigued by crypto economics. They were intrigued by kind of new protocols, software development. It was a pretty narrow subset of people. And it really felt like if we wanted to take a lot of these ideas to the mainstream, we had to get creators involved. We had to get creative people involved. And so FWB was really born out of this idea that most of us have known creating value on networks 
and not participating in that upside. And so what I wanted to do was really show a lot of my peers how collectivists creating value and creating networks can be in kind of Web3. And so in short, what it is, it's a social club or it's a private community that you can join if you own 50 or X, right now it's 75 FWB tokens. Um, there was only ever 1 million tokens that will be minted. And so with a fixed supply of tokens, if you go and you create a cooler private network right now, which is primarily a Discord, you can imagine there'll be more demand on that fixed supply of tokens, which will make the tokens that you hold more valuable. And so all of us can imagine a world where, hey, when we joined Facebook, we got Facebook stock and we made Facebook a cool place to be. And as it appreciated in value, we saw upside. That wasn't possible in Web2. These are the kind of things that we're exploring in Web3 where hopefully folks can unlock or participate in the upside they're creating in these networks. Awesome. And, and what sort of value are you offering the club members within FWB? It seems like you guys have a lot of cool stuff uh, going on. I saw you guys launched um, a publication today or announced the, the launch of a publication today. You guys have had real world events. What's, what sort of things are happening? Yeah, I mean, really what we try to be is this cornerstone between culture and crypto. And that started with this private discord. So there are channels in there for, of course, trading crypto or buying NFTs, but there are also channels in there for parenting and for skincare and for things that any of us are interested in. And so outside of that, the community, and this is one of the really compelling parts about DAOs, is the community wanted to get together in person and we all couldn't agree more. We thought that IRL interactions are some of the best ways to create strong ties in the community. And so we threw an event at, at Bitcoin Miami where you needed to have a certain amount of FWB tokens to get in. It went really well. We had an incredible time. And so we built a software layer on top of that called Gatekeeper that allows us to check people into events if they have enough FWB tokens. Uh, beyond that, there is a newsletter. So if you're intrigued by what's happening in the Discord and you can't keep up with all the different channels, we have a professional editorial team that will come in, kind of condense it all into a readable uh, newsletter. You can get that. And then we're constantly developing tools. There was a hackathon a few weeks ago where people who are designers, developers, and just everyday users could riff on ideas and make things and make out custom merch. So all kinds of cool stuff going on. I really describe it more like a city even than a, than a, than a, than a social club. That's, that's awesome. That sounds incredible. And, um, you know, you alluded to some of the areas, um, that, you know, uh, DAOs are sort of going into, um, I'd be curious to hear where, what, what arenas you think are sort of ripe for disruption when it comes to DAOs? Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's, um, there's an expression Jeff Bezos says that like your margin is my opportunity. And I think that applies to a lot of traditional web two platforms as well. I think there, it, it seems crazy. People are like, holy cow, a doge meme sold for a hundred million dollars or some absurd number. I think it, it's, it's pretty hard for people to grasp how much value they've created for a lot of these platforms. You know, your mm -hmm. funny viral dancing video on TikTok creates hundreds of millions of dollars of value for those companies that locks people into those platforms. They're watching advertisements, et cetera, et cetera. And so that to me is the kind of thing I want to speak to first and foremost. If you're a creator, you created a ton of value for platforms that you haven't participated in. And I think there's opportunity for you to do so. So there's tons of room around social, around media, and those things are just starting to be figured out. I think beyond that, anywhere folks want to organize to better their, their, their reality from public goods to, uh, you know, both online and offline to, you know, any kind of like climate based stuff. And there's a ton of opportunities to use protocols, to use on chain data to incentivize politicians and, you know, just citizens to, to do better so that we meet some of our climate targets. But I would say for a lot of this audience, media and kind of the, the creative uh, and the creator world is, is ripe for disruption and lots of opportunity there. And I'd be curious for creators in particular, um, uh, they, they're creating a lot of value for other platforms. Do you think the opportunity is for them to create more like closed communities, like bring people into discords or is it developing more like their own platforms that they're going to be growing audiences on? I think it kind of works in both directions. I know that like, uh, you know, there's a whole subset of creators who might have, you know, uh, a thousand or 5,000 really passionate fans. And maybe they're not getting, you know, the, the 10 million subs that they're excited about. Mm -hmm. But if you can find ways to engage those 5,000 fans and give them ownership and what you're now building collectively, 
that's a really strong incentive for them to go and champion what you're doing as well. And so there, are, I'm sure there are people on here who were early subs of Shane Dawson or something, and they went and screamed from the mountaintops to go follow or sub Shane, but they didn't participate in that upside. So the, the yeah. flywheel there, the opportunity to say, hey, we're going to make our, my audience a part of our thing and shifting from like, you know, me to our or me to we, I think is a very important opportunity for folks to, to recognize because if they can use that, they can create incentive structures that, that accrue a lot of value to everyone. That's so awesome. Discord, but more broadly, awesome. all of it. <laughs> yeah. Now, now um, this is more of a, a selfish question. Um, as somebody who creates some content, what would be the best place to sort of uh, dip your toes in the water and, and begin to navigate and learn how to kind of go from that me to we and, and really invite the community into the process? Yeah, I think one of the unique things about Web3, I, I've always kind of said like, you know, Web2 is kind of about building a product and then building a community. So, hey, maybe you went on YouTube and you created some videos about cooking and then you went and searched for people who cared about cooking. You know, one of the opportunities now is to go and build that community and find people who are, uh, you know, also interested in cooking and then talk about what you guys want to go build together. And what you'll find mm -hmm. is that collectively you can go further than you can go on your own. And so I, I would say, like, go and find people who are passionate, what you're passionate about, find ways to organize and then find ways to kind of align those forces in, in a certain direction and then incentivize each other by saying, hey, you know, here's X amount of tokens. People that want to participate what we're doing can buy those tokens and use, you know, decentralized exchanges like Uniswap to, to compensate and kind of like reinforce what we're building. Okay, cool. And, um, you know, I think uh, anywhere where audiences and communities develop brands sort of naturally want to gravitate towards, I think it's early days. We're not seeing um, too many brands dipping their toes in the water in this space, but I'd be curious, what, what sort of place do you see or space do you see uh, brands playing within in this space? Because to a certain extent, if like I'm a, I'm a participant in DAO, like I contributed to the development of it, I have a say in its governance, I may not want a bunch of ads. And um, it, it really has gotten me thinking as somebody that works in advertising, what's that next evolution for brands? I'd be curious, you're, you're much deeper in this space. What do you see that sort of looking like? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, advertising has such a tenuous relationship with creators. Some people describe advertising as the original sin of the internet, right? But and maybe <laughs> Proto solves for some of those things. Um, but but all that is to say, I think that like brands that want to work in Web three are going to have to probably burn some boats and and do a bit of a of a redirection. I always think about when Netflix moved from mailing DVDs to building a streaming video service. You know, that was a very different business and they had to do an about face and, and until they, they really made a decision, I think it was pretty difficult. So I, I would encourage brands that want to get involved and say like, okay, look, let's take a deep dive. Let's think about if, if we have a meaningful brand or community and if we can engage that community and kind of make them a part of what we're building, can, 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 you know, does that make sense? You know, I always think about a brand like Glossier, which, well, you know, was so good at building this community, yeah. listening to them and building products for them. That to me is probably what the, the brand of the future looks like more than some person in an ivory tower deciding what, what the community is going to get. Yeah, I was uh, brainstorming with a buddy who, who's deeper in this space than I am. And we were talking about how, like, if you had a hypothetical, like, running club that was like a DAO, like, you had two brands wanting to reach that audience. One, you know, like, uh, pays a bunch of money, gets the tokens, gets in and just starts blasting with ads odds are the community is going to revolt and kick them out and then bring in a brand that is willing to be adding value and participating and actually being a member of the community, which I think is, is going to be good and really, um, uh, I think push advertisers to be creative and not just sort of like blast a message out to the world. Yeah. And this actually, well, I'll probably try to like answer that, that question and Jessica's here. You know, one of the interesting things about tokens is they can be used for governance, for, for making decisions about where the DAO is headed, but that can be kind of considered novel ways. Let's say you have a running club and, you know, you have a million tokens and the running club controls, you know, 500,000, another 250,000 are left in a DAO and 250,000 are out there in the wild to be traded. They're on, on exchanges. 
you could say, hey guys, we're going to allow anyone in our city to buy tokens and we're gonna do a vote for where the running club goes to eat food after we run. In which case, you now have a few different players. You have people in the running club who are gonna to wanna to vote with their tokens because they wanna eat pizza or they wanna eat tacos or whatever it is. You also have speculators that then come in and say, holy cow, I bet a bunch of businesses are now gonna try and buy these tokens. So I'm gonna to try to front run them and drive the token up. And then you have local businesses who are gonna be doing some math saying, okay, if I can get a hundred you know, running club people to my taco spot every Wednesday this month, how much is that worth to me? And if so, can I buy enough tokens to make sure that I win that thing? And so that's kind of a novel way you could introduce brands into the equation where it's like, okay, if you want us there, put your money where your mouth is. You're now a token holder. And you're now also invested in seeing this, this, this running club do well. And so maybe they're not giving you guys food poisoning because they want you to go out and meet your goals. <laughs> you're now vested in the outcomes of this run club beyond just this one-time interaction. Um, and with Jessica, I would say like thinking through that framework, it's quite interesting. It, it, she, she had a question, you know, how would you suggest that creators get started with leveraging the opportunities value that these technologies offer? We have around 500,000 subs on YouTube and not sure what we can do with that. Depending on what your channel is good for, you could say, hey, you know what, next week, we're gonna have a, a video about X or a video about Y. And we want you guys to tell us where we're gonna go. And the way you can do that, purchase a token. With that token, you get access to our private conversation and you get a chance to vote on where we're headed. And now all of a sudden they're producers, they're a part of the equation. And when your video comes out, they're gonna be so excited. That, oh my gosh, I was a part of this thing. I can't wait to tell my friends. That's that's really fascinating. It's almost like a bunch of micro economies emerging. That's exactly right. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of its incentives. And, and you know, if you think about the way startups work, employees get equity. And so they're aligned in the direction of this business. Investors mm -hmm. get equity and users have often lived in the outside of that. So oftentimes the incentives that are good for Vine weren't great for the Vine users. And if you yeah. try to kind of like, you know, get everyone all entangled, all of a sudden everyone's trying to push in the same direction. Awesome. We've, we've got a, another brand related question here from Taylor. Have you seen any brands launch a DAO in a significant way so far? If not, who would you love to see launch a DAO and why? I'm trying to think if I've seen anyone. There's been some interesting experiments around NFTs, like Visa bought a CryptoPunk and some other stuff like that. You know, as far as brands that I think get it or at least seemingly get it and might be able to do things well you could imagine like taco bell dow or kind of like a fast food dow because yeah. i feel like people have a lot of opinions about things they should bring back you could imagine mcdonald's allowing people to vote on you know what time breakfast should start or where they should test their next thing or whatever that is i think those are those are easy accessible ones they're widely distributed you're going to be able to touch people all, all over the world um, but beyond that, I think, you know, really at any business that's interested in kind of making their fans a part of what they do could, could explore it. Awesome. Now, uh, it, it being a decentralized, uh, autonomous organization, um, do you, and, and you're running FWB, uh, or you're a part of FWB, you founded it. How do you manage sort of the organizational pieces of it, knowing it's all, I mean, with it being all decentralized and going through voting, are there any sort of like lessons learned or insights that you can share with viewers, people who maybe are just starting a DAO or thinking of starting a DAO? Yeah, I mean, I think to me, the best model to explore is cities, you know, or, or, or states like nation states. Um, Cause really what you're doing is, is you're building an economy. You know, why do people do things in the United States? Why do they repair potholes? Cause they get paid, you know, and, and when mm -hmm. they get paid with the token of the United States DAO, the U S dollar, they then take that and they pay somebody else in the DAO who's creating value and maybe they're a seamstress or whatever it is. And so I, I think, you know, really what you want to think about is like, how do I create an economy that's rewarding people and how do I try to create incentives that create more value for this, this economy? And that's where, why these things work is it's okay. In order for this, 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 this token to appreciate or for this, this thing to have value, we need people to create value and that fly rule starts yeah. to compound. And we're all trying to create value. I love that analogy. Um, 
going back to something you referenced earlier, I may, meant to uh, follow up on it. You mentioned that there's a Dow trying to buy a sports team. Can you can you speak to some of the more out there examples that you, you you've uh, seen? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, there are some of the early examples were just NFT collector DAOs. So there's one called Pleaser DAO that said, "Hey, we all want to pool our capital to go bid on really big, important artworks." Because we think they're going to be worth a lot of money, and they got early. They built. They, they bought a Doge meme that I think they then resold for like twenty five x. And so, as an investment vehicle, it works well. Less obvious things, I think, like Climate DAO is a DAO focused on climate change, and I believe what they're doing is they are tokenizing carbon credits from trees. I need to go back and look, but the idea that you can, you know, sell carbon credits via tokens something that could, could accelerate and kind of create more liquid carbon credit markets, which could incentivize more people to plant trees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are, there is a DAO, I believe, I think it's called Krauss DAO with a, a wink and nod to Jerry Krauss of the Bulls. Uh, I got to remember that's the right name, but they're trying to buy a pro sports team. They're going to pool capital wow. and they're going to try to buy a, a pro sports team and they want to make decisions for that sports team as a DAO. And the Green Bay Packers, I believe, are, are, are community owned or, or employee owned. And I think they, they want to follow that model and say, hey, look, we can do this with better infrastructure for voting and for decisions. That's amazing. Now, how big do you think these can get? Like, do you think the next, you know, the next Facebook could be a DAO in theory? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really the kind of final boss of crypto, right? Is like the regulatory environment. Right. If you think about the 90s, there were all kinds of questions about what the internet could be. And you know um, the Clinton regime and others decided, hey, we we're going to make the United States a really favorable place to build internet companies. And as a result, Google, Facebook, all of these Goliaths, you know, they're, they're American organizations. I think this stuff is going to happen regardless. But for a lot of us here in the states, what we're going to need to do is, is, is really kind of help shape and inform our, our politicians such that they enable this kind of this, this kind of ingenuity. Um, I think. Crypto started with a certain color. People kind of saw it as this like libertarian pipe dream way to avoid taxes and do do uh, you know tax fraud. It, it, it's it's evolved way beyond that now, and it actually I think can unlock yeah. a lot of really good things for people. And so I think it's important for us to kind of like learn as much as we can, share information at the Thanksgiving dinner table or wherever you're at, and try to get people on board because this is going to unlock a ton of value. And one thing that I'll speak to quickly is. Financial markets and financial instruments intimidate a lot of my peers. You know, they're creative people who've always seen oil futures or cotton futures as places, you know, hedge funds that exploit them. And as a result, they haven't wanted to participate in those games. When I look at something like Doge, the Doge coin, I see old finance boomers get upset about it because they don't know how to trade a joke. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. my peers have an information advantage. They know how memes circulate. And as a result, they know how to trade this better than some Goldman Sachs bro. And so when you look at the kind of financial windfalls that Goldman Sachs bros have had because they know how to trade oil futures, when you begin to tokenize mm -hmm. things in our world, we can give you who understands how handbags, you know, a travel or appreciate the same opportunity to speculate that traditional hedge funds have. And that to me, I think is the real wizardry and the real genius here is that we can redistribute a lot of value by opening up some of this financialization to people with all kinds of different domain expertise. Awesome. Um, one question, uh, you, viewer question just came in, but something that popped into my head is right now, so many of these communities are being built within Discord. Do you see that as sort of um, just a jumping off point or, or will these communities continue to live in there? You know, I think that's probably going to be a jumping off point. I think the dream for a lot of folks is to have decentralized solutions. Um, you know, there's a world where Discord flips the switch and everybody's got to go. Um, obviously, I think there's, the dream would be to have a, a decentralized community-owned solution that could take care of a lot mm -hmm. of these things. Discord's been a, a great partner thus far. I know they're working on a bunch of Web3 solutions right now that should hopefully elevate the experience. But um, yeah, I think we're going to see, it reminds me very much of like the, the internet, kind of Web2 when it was starting. I remember people talking about Twitter as microblogging. You know, mm -hmm. you're like, I guess that makes sense yeah. in describing it. Like it's blogging, but it's shorter. There, there's going to be a whole new evolution and a new, new vocabulary for describing things to come. And we don't even know what they are yet. Yeah. Yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, all right. So Galen asked, Trevor, how do you see the intersection of cool things like Will and Michaela with things like DAOs and Web3? Yeah, I think, you know, what we're working on is I really see everyone on the web as, as, a, as a storyteller. Um, you know, people don't think of, you know, Zion Williamson, the basketball player as a storyteller, but he absolutely is. He's had his whole life mediated via Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and all of this narrative has kind of lived without a canon. That a through line and what we're building you know with with, with rudd and, and for little michaela is effectively web3 tools to define that canon on chain and then to allow people to collect that canon and so for michaela it makes a lot of sense you can buy a moment in her story that's really compelling but imagine if you could collect zion williamson's big high school dunk and then trade that years later or if you could collect ben affleck dumping a bunch of his ex-girlfriend stuff in the trash only to see him and general lopez get back together and, and and speculate on that and so again kind of unlocking these instruments for people who understand these markets better than trad financial markets i think is a big part of, of this future and redistributing value that's such an, a fascinating way to view things because yeah it is it is value it's just a different form of value um now uh for people like me who maybe i want to get together with some buddies and and start a dow are there good no code solutions? Like can, can a uh, relative novice spin one up? And if so, what, what resource would you point selfishly me to? <laughs> yeah, I, I think one theme to kind of check out is, is an idea called progressive decentralization. So you start in a pretty centralized way and then you work your way out to more and more decentralization. It's a theme that Jesse Walden, uh, an investor at Variant came up with. But the simplest way is to mint some tokens. You can do it really easily with a tool called Roll tryroll.com t-r-y-r-o-l-l.com you can the CEO create... was just on last week oh fantastic yeah yes. and then you can use a multi-signature wallet like a gnosis g-n-o-s-i-s multi-sig m-u-l-t-i-s-i-g a gnosis multi-sig wallet so all that means is we've made these tokens they live in this wallet and the, the, these tokens can't move from this wallet unless all of us say it's okay now you have mm -hmm. an element of decentralization and you can decide how you want to use them. That's the most simple way. You can say, hey, you know what? We're going to give everybody tokens. And if you don't go on the run, you forfeit your tokens and three out of five of us can sign to move them over or whatever it is. Um, but that's how you start. You can create a Discord and token gate it with a tool called collab.land, C-O-L-L-A-B dot L-A-N-D. That's a great way to, again, tokenize a community. Works with Telegram as well. But those are kind of like the, the really simple ways of saying, hey, we have a token. In order for it to move, we all need to sign off on a thing. We have a private place to communicate and a need to communicate in order to you need, you need a certain amount of tokens. This is awesome. That's hugely helpful. I've been kicking around the idea for a while, so I was curious to ask that. Um, let's see here. Uh, I know we're about time. Uh, do you have any parting thoughts or anything you'd like to, to plug? Uh, I would say uh, there's a question here as well. Things like, yeah, should we answer that? Yeah, why don't yeah, we answer that and then we can wrap it up. Uh, so Todd asked, uh, what, yeah, go ahead. I'll let you go. Okay, cool. Uh, what, what does this all mean for regular people just using the web beyond those actively looking to get into trading or with deep pockets to buy NFTs? How do you see these ideas trickling down to everyday users in the coming years? I suppose that's a billion dollar question really, LOL, but curious, what do you think? Um, so the, one of the important questions there is for the everyday user, I imagine the everyday user uh, it will be, will be using a network with lower fees. I mean, one of the things you're kind of speaking to about speaking to is that how difficult some of these prohibitive, these networks can be because of fees on Ethereum or other places. There's already great layer two solutions like Arbitrum or Optimism. I'm a big fan of the Flow blockchain, which was built by uh, Dapper Labs. That's gonna make it incredibly efficient and cheap for people to use blockchains. And so I think a lot of people will be using them without knowing they're using them. But the most important thing for them, in my opinion, it will mean data portability. So imagine how many years you've been bummed on Facebook, but you've been stuck in Facebook because they have all of your friends, all of your blog posts, all your photos, all of those things. Data portability in Web3 means because all of that lives on a public database in the blockchain, you can take that wherever you want. You can take it to Facebook. Mm -hmm. Someone can hard fork Facebook and remove something, you can move it over there. Someone can hard fork it, add other features, do whatever you want. It allows you to vote with your feet and move away from platforms that don't serve you. 
I think that will be the major difference for the end user. Um, that's mine. Last, yeah, that's that's a big one. Um, the last piece I would say before we go, I know we're running a bit over, is that this stuff is intimidating, but once you start diving down the rabbit hole, it can get really exciting. You can find yourself learning a lot more. If you want to kind of start with big macro thoughts, I think David Graeber's debt, 5,000 years of money, I believe that's what it's, it's called. It's just an oral history of money. And it's a history period of money. And David Graeber is great at speaking to what money is and how it works. Um, but beyond that, I think diving into crypto Twitter, it, it, I'll, I'll drop some names on my Twitter if you'd like. People like Chris Dixon, C. Dixon is a great person to follow. Um, on the trading side, people like Loomdart, L-O-O-M-D-A-R-T. Um, and, and then you know, there's, there's really great people across the board. I say Lee Jin, another investor who's quite good. Uh, it could be helpful. So lots of people who are figuring this stuff out and in parallel with all of us. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really uh, am grateful for you joining us here today. I learned a ton. Hopefully the viewers did as well. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Have a great one. Peace.